Hello and welcome to History Hack. It is another hedge hopping outing today and this one should be really, really exciting. Today I'm delighted to be joined by John Bernstein, who is an author, historian and the arms and armament curator at the National Museum of the Marine Corps in Virginia. And today we're going to be looking at a fascinating subject, one that's close to my heart. It's going to be close air support in the Second World War. And unfortunately, very few typhoons in this because we are going to be talking about the P-47 Thunderbolt and the adversary that was Flak. So, John, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me. So what's, what is COVID life like for you in the States? Because you moved across the country as well. Yeah, we did. Uh, we moved from Oklahoma to Virginia last summer. And uh, it's definitely been, been interesting seeing the changes in attitudes towards uh, COVID. Um, but, you know, things seem to be stabilizing here. The numbers are going down and uh, obviously everybody's wearing a mask here and, and uh, social distancing and teleworking. And as you can see, I'm, I'm home today. Um, it, it is sort of the, the norm, uh, but we're getting there. Um, the museum has been closed. Uh, we opened briefly September 8th and we closed again on November 23rd. And we're hoping we're hearing some rumblings uh, around probably late June, early July. Um, but that, of course, is dependent on the numbers. Yeah, it's same same sort of dates they're telling us here, um, which we hope will happen because then they might let the pubs open. Exactly. Which is, <laughs> which is the only yeah. thing anybody really cares about. So I guess the other question is, is how does an army man start working for the Corps? Um, I've been... Uh, well, this year actually is my 30th year uh, working in military museums. I started my senior year in high school uh, working at the USS Intrepid in New, in New York. I uh, spent the past eight years as the director of the uh, Air Defense Artillery Museum in uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And this really was the right job at the right time. And uh, so we moved out here last Virginia, uh, last, uh, last uh, August uh, to Virginia. And uh, you know I've been uh, been doing this job ever since. So it's pretty exciting. So you, you you're a jug man. That sounds terrible. We'll edit that out. You're a thunderbolt man. <laughs> we might leave that in now. Um, you're a thunderbolt man. So let's for those people who probably don't know too much about it. What what is the P forty seven thunderbolt, um, and how is it going to pertain to our conversation that we're going to have today? Okay, well, the P-47, the Jug, uh, which is short for Juggernaut, uh, just because it was a massive aircraft. It was the largest single-engine fighter of World War II. Uh, uh, really uh, and intended initially as a high-altitude interceptor, and that's how the, the Army Air Force brought it into service. Um, it was the Army's first aircraft to sustain 400 miles an hour, uh, or to exceed uh, 400 miles an hour level flight. And... Uh, its uh, first flight was on 6 May of 1941, and uh, was adopted uh, by the Army and Air Corps uh, fairly soon after that, and ended, entered squadron service with the 56 fighter group. Uh, they, however, were not the first uh, to, to enter combat with it. Uh, they were still training stateside, working out all the bugs with it when uh, the first combat models went over to the 4th fighter group, which, of course, evolved out of the Eagle squadrons. Um, and they transitioned from the Spitfire to the Jug, which was a major, major conversion. Of course, you know, there, there are uh, old adages about you know, uh, being able to stand up and run around inside the cockpit uh, compared to, to the size of the Spitfire. There were mixed reviews of it when it first entered, entered service. Uh, Colonel Don Blakesley, who's the commander of the Fourth Fighter Group, said uh, of it, you know, it, it sure as hell better be able to dive because it can't climb. Uh, and one of the biggest criticisms early on was its its uh, its prop just didn't have the lifting surface to get it to altitude uh, in any sort of you know, reasonable amount of time. Um, just about every type of, of Allied and German fighter could outclimb it. However, once it got up to altitude and it could fly higher than just about anyone, its high altitude performance was incredible. It was sustaining much higher speeds at altitude than, than most other aircraft, and because of its weight, it was able to dive better than just about it. So, and of course, um, its armament was eight 50 caliber machine guns, um, which was you know, outgunned just about anything in the sky. Yeah, you can, you know, there's the whole 20 millimeter versus 50 caliber um, argument, but the rate of fire 
uh, ammunition capacity, the ability to get it up to, to where the enemy was, uh, was unmatched uh, as, uh, as far as the people were saying. You can't really argue about the hitting power of 850 calibers, can you? Even, even as someone who's got a, a slight leaning towards the good old Hispano too. Sure. But um, that is a lot of a lot of very large caliber flying around. And yeah, there we go. lean across. This is great for a radio show. I've got my, my ah. 50 caliber. There's a Barrett round, but nice. inner, of course. Of so course. That, that's my, my, my paperweight on my, on my desk. Okay. Which just sort of keeps me, keeps, keeps me good. One of the things about the, the, the jug that just blows my mind is that engine and it's whopping great turbocharger sat behind the pilot. Sure. That, that double wasp just gave, that amazing amount of bulk, that incredible performance, didn't it? Yes, uh, you know, 200, uh, 2,000 horsepower to start, and the last models were pushing 2,800 horsepower. Um, and the, the the reason for the size of the jug too is just the the ducting system that that ran off the exhaust driven uh, ran the, the exhaust driven turbocharger. Uh, the turbo is actually in the rear of the airplane. Um, but there's a massive system of ducts that comes off the engine and blows that exhaust back, gets the, gets the turbo running, and then uh, pushes the air back up to, to the carburetor. And it gave that that amazing high altitude performance that, that you know, just couldn't be uh, so I, I, I love it. The, the sound of it, especially when it starts up, because they always disappear in that big cloud of gray smoke. Yes. And yes. oh, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Um, and it's uh, yeah, we, we're, we're very lucky to have Nelly B flying when we get to have air shows. And for those of us of a certain age, remember her from back in the day as no guts, no glory as well. Mm -hmm. um, but go. Okay, so I do have one weird question. So this is the Razorback thing. Because okay. um, traditionally, it's just the P-47s that had that sort of name of Razorback with the high back before the cut down in the bubble canopy. Is that true? Because some, ah, there we go, we got a model of one. The, the sort of, the rule of thumb is the Ds in people's heads tend to have the cut down rear fuselage, but not all of them did, did they? This is really no. geeky points, but I, so, it, this is what this show's about. The, the P-47 production is kind of weird. Uh, the P-47D came into service uh, in mid-43 um, with the, the just straight P-47D-RE. And the first upgrade was the dash one dash RE. Uh, RE designates the, the Republic Farmingdale uh, uh, plant in, in, uh, in Farmingdale, New York. Uh, there were also later on P-47D-RAs, which were produced in Evansville, Indiana. So that, uh, that will give you the, where it was produced. And then the production block number tells you what modifications were done to it. So the Razorbacks were the P-47B all the way up through P-47D-23. The Dash 25s were the first that introduced the bubble canopy. And that bubble canopy was a cut-down Typhoon canopy on the original XP-47K. Um, and Typhoon was the first uh, Allied aircraft to have that bubble canopy. And uh, we said, hey, that's a pretty good idea. Why don't we do that? And so uh, it was adopted. And uh, there were actually far more uh, bubble tops produced than uh, than Razorbacks, uh, even though it was done in a much uh, shorter period of time. I'd I'd love to do a show just about canopy development. Oh yeah, because it's it's utterly fascinating. Because you you look at the the trials that they went through for basically blowing plastic without having distortion. Sure. Um, and everyone goes on about the Malcolm Hood on the Spitfire. But oh, yeah. until you're up close to Spitfire, you don't really realize how small that is. Mm -hmm. Until you start getting to, you know, Mustang, Typhoon, Thunderbolt, which are much wider aircraft, sure. you know, that's a lot more plastic that you can't have distortion on because you've got to be able to see that spec off in the distance. Yeah, they actually, you know, put uh, put uh, Malcolm's on uh, P-47s uh, fairly regularly as well. It's an aside and a, a little cul-de-sac that we will not go down because we've got a <laughs> massive subject to sure. talk about. So for my shame, I know very, very little about the 12th Air Force. Um, okay. And I, I think that might be pretty fair with with with, with most people because you know the, the eighth and the ninth kind of dominates right. our thinking. You know, they're they're the ones over Europe, um, the, the the mighty eighth and the, the ninth tactical, and but we 
you know, one thing that we've been trying to do here as well, we've, you know, we had Mike Beck told on about Bardia recently as well, um, mm. is change this focus. So tell us about the 12th, who were they? And this important moment when, they're, when their focus shifts from high in the sky to, to down and dirty. We need to go back a little further uh, because really the, the jug story starts with the Desert Air Force. Get the exact exact dates, but uh, the 57th Fighter Group is the first Army Air Force unit over to uh, North Africa. Uh, and they were over there before Torch. They were directly under RAF command, and uh, they really learned how to do tactical air missions uh, under the RAF. And as uh, you know, as U.S. forces built up, uh, we got the 79th, the 324th. Um, fighter groups in, um, of course, then also you know, the 325th, the Checker Tails, a um, couple other, a uh, couple of other units as well, and built up some some pretty significant uh, tactical air power there, uh, all flying the P40F, uh, Merlin engined uh, P40, and they started to transition to the Thunderbolt in, uh, in about October of 43. Uh, that's really when things start to reorganize too. Because um, the American Air Force that had, had been built up under Desert Air Force uh, started to be uh, the, the Ninth Air Force, uh, but the Ninth was a composite Air Force. They had bombers there as well, and so uh, units like the Fifty Seventh fell under DAF, and then they fell under uh, Ninth Air Force, and then there was a massive reorganization. The Ninth went to England, and the Twelfth uh, stood up. In, uh, in North Africa, and then the 12th was really the major tactical air force uh, for the remainder of the war in, in the Mediterranean theater. Um, so the 325th fighter group, which had been flying P-40s and then P-47s, went to, um, was then starting the transition to the Mustang by 843. They went off to the 15th Air Force, which was the strategic counterpart to the 12th, and the 57th, 79th, 324th, um, a couple other groups uh, formed the, the core of the tactical um, fighter command assets of the uh, 12th Air Force. Um, and they used the, uh, you know, the tactics they learned uh, there to, to really build up uh, 12th's uh, ground attack capability. Now, the Thunderbolt at that point, in, the, in, in mid to late 43, was not a ground attack airplane. Uh, in fact, there was an adage that, that you did not engage the enemy below 12,000 feet um, in, in the people he said they'd get, you'd get chewed up, basically, because you couldn't really climb it. Um, but there were a number of uh, great pilots uh, with the 57th. Uh, the commander of the 65th Fighter Squadron, uh, Gil Lyman, figured out how to rig the, uh, the, um, the pylons to um, to more effectively drop bombs. Um, by late 43, the, the P-47 D-15 was coming into, into service, and the D-15 was the first to have wing pilots. Prior to that, jugs didn't have them. Uh, they had fittings for long-range ferry tanks, and they could sort of cobble on um, makeshift pylons for long-range flights, um, bringing them pretty much from the States to Greenland to Iceland and whatever. But uh, so the plumbing was all there, with the D-15, they added the pylons so you could uh, carry drop tanks, uh, except the release handles for those drop tanks were not, it wasn't a button on your stick, it wasn't handles in front of you, there were three handles on the lower left side of the cockpit. So as you're flying along here, you have to you know, turn, and of course now you've just turned your stick to try to release the uh, bombs or drop tanks. So what Gil Wyman did, he and his armament chief looked at how the mechanisms were, and they rigged up a system that put the three handles right up at the bottom of the control panel. You had two on the left side for your wing tanks, for your, your bombs, and then one on the right side for your, your center line. Like that. They then figured out, okay, we can carry three 500-pound bombs. Um, they did a, a little experimentation. They were actually able to carry you know, a 1,000-pound bomb under each wing. The modifications that they came up with and tested were uh, once they, they were able to make it work successfully, they did the modification on, on all the aircraft in the group and then all the aircraft in the theater. And th that modification was actually sent back to the public. And with the D-28 
uh, production block, it was incorporated as standard. So um, really, you know, the 12th Air Force was key to the development of the, uh, the Thunderbolt as a fighter bomber. I'm, I'm just looking up a picture of the Thunderbolts cockpit from our friends over at the, the Vintage Aviation Echo. We've got a fantastic article about flying the P-47 with Rich Grace. If those handles were all the way down there on the left, that is a long way to shift and get back to, because that is a big cockpit. Yes. I think that's that's one of the great features of of, of these sorts of mods that, that go through on, on many of the aircraft types. They made them work on the line and yes. very quickly. Yes. that would feed through into the production models so that they wouldn't have to be continually doing this. That's, yeah, that's, that's really cool. It's just such a huge cockpit. It's such a big airplane anyways, but sure. it's, it's, <laughs> that's, that's a, that's a lot of space, but I guess it's this, this, that problem of not having the purchase on the, on the prop to, to, to get it to do what it needs to do. Yes. Sub actually, you know, that was addressed with the, starting with the, the D21, uh, where they changed the prop on it, um, they changed the engine too, um, from the Dash 21 to the Dash 59 or 63 engine, uh, which had more horsepower and went from 2,000 to 2,300, um, better water injection, and also a better prop on it. Uh, really, there were three major different types of, of propellers they used, sorry, four, four major types. Uh, there was the original, what they called the toothpick prop uh, from Curtis Electric, and there was the Hamilton Standard, uh, which was the first paddle blade prop uh, they used with the, uh, the D22, uh, D25, and D27. Um, and then there were two other paddle blade Curtis props that they used. Um, the the uh, wider of the two was the uh, AO Smith blades, uh, which really gave a significant, it's almost a thousand foot a minute uh, increase in rate of climb. Wow. Um, it's a really uh, significant uh, rate of movement. Now, it's still, Still climbed worse than the Mustang and worse than the Spitfire and worse than the, the P-38. Uh, but uh, especially, especially the P-47M, which I don't really pay much attention to because it was one of those eighth Air Force boats. Um, but they, uh, with the C-Series engine and, and the Curtis prop, it really uh, screamed and, and could, was just about the equal uh, in the climb to, to any other uh, on the time. Propellers are another interesting subject, or air screw to our older listeners. Um, but on the P-47, the, the paddle prop is an apt name because it's one of the few where you can genuinely see the difference in just shape, size, um, and, and, and curvature on it because it's, its nickname is, is apt because it does look like a, a canoe paddle. We've touched on the 12th. That's the thing that's quite fascinating about the 12th is a lot of, I'm just going to bring up their commanders because Jimmy Doolittle was, was boss of the 12th for a while before he, he, he was brought North. Um, it's I, when I was looking up, it was surprising how many names I recognized and how little is written about it. Cause I, I did a quick Google for it, for books, seeing what Osprey had on it as you have an Osprey title coming out soon, which we will plug shortly. But the twelfth isn't isn't mentioned that I could find other than in some rather expensive, drier terms. Why why is that? Is that just because of the theater they were in, or yeah, more than anything? Um, and you know, there were only six P forty seven groups in twelfth. Um, they were separated into two uh, tactical air commands, twelfth and twenty second. And, and really, you know, the 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 Mediterranean is a forgotten theater in a lot of ways. Uh, one of the really cool things uh, I found out while I was writing uh, the current book, I mean, when I did the, the 12th Air Force P-47 book a couple of years ago, and that was, that was fantastic researching and getting uh, through that. But this one, um, during the, the train up for Europe, you know, for, for the, the lead up to the invasion, they were having to, to train up an entire Air Force's worth of P-47 pilots on tactics that they really didn't know. Um, I mean, the, the ninth was going to be the tactical air power uh, counterpart to the eighth, and they were going to be supporting the armies as they went across the channel, and they didn't have the training to, to really be the ground attack pilots they needed. So uh, General Caseda, who was the commander of, uh, of the ninth fighter command at the time, worked out an exchange program with the 12th Air Force. And they sent pilots down there. They brought pilots up to England to train up our guys 
Um, they also looked at the mechanisms that they were using for bomb releasing and, and things like that and incorporated some of that. Uh, they also created some of their own, you know, like the A4 electric bomb release was something that was incorporated in Europe uh, rather than the Mediterranean uh, for a, an alternative method of, of being able to release uh, bombs. Um, so the, the coordination between the, the 12th and the 9th to get everybody ready for, uh, for the invasion was something that I wasn't really aware of until I really started getting into Cassavetes uh, documents. And that was just fascinating to read. That's an incredibly modern thing to do. You, you know, you, you wouldn't, you know, the, the exchange programs that we sort of think of today, and I, 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 I used to work with a few ex-RAF guys who spent many a happy day blasting around Nevada in sure. the latest American toys. But it's, it isn't really something you think about was, would be happening a lot because, you know, in the RAF, it was very much, especially when Second Tactical came on, that's where you stayed unless you transferred out and did something entirely different. But yeah. that, that's, that's a fascinating thing to do that they were, you know, Caseda had that sort of now to say, right, well, let's do this properly. Let, let's, let's send, because yeah. you're not really wanting to, to risk your experienced crews to go off, especially training. Goodness, it's, it's bad enough having someone shoot at them. But that, that's, that's remarkable. That's really fascinating. So your new book, which we're going to talk about, is um, part of Osprey's new dual series, um, yep. P-47 versus Flak. So let's talk about Flak for a moment. Okay. And then we're going to get into a little bit of the ETO and, and the reality of it. But I think mainly be, because I have this weird disconnect in my head that I said that I always conflate the year number of the weapon mm -hmm. of, of the German sat with, with the, the armament size. So if I see 38 and I'm annoyingly tweeting something at somebody, I will always say that's 38 millimeter, which is not right. So there was a myriad of, of German anti-aircraft weapons. Everybody knows about the 88s and everybody, when they hear flak thinks 88s, but realistically in this context, what are we going to be talking about? Mainly uh, 20, well, two centimeter uh, up through 3.7 centimeter. There were some five centimeter anti-aircraft guns, but not many. They were deployed to Normandy. Uh, I do touch on them briefly, but there were only a handful of those. Uh, so really it, it was you know, two centimeter, 20 millimeter and, uh, and 3.7. Uh, some 40 millimeters as well, because they did have a uh, license for version of both. That was those I found were mainly in, in Kriegsmarine units, but, uh, but they were along the coast. The uh, probably the best low to medium uh, altitude uh, any aircraft gun was the 37 millimeter uh, Flak 43. It was a significant improvement over the Flak 36, 37, 37 millimeter gun. Uh, again, that, See, that that's what really gets me. Is every once in a while they marry up. Yeah, the <laughs> uh, the, the Flak thirty six thirty seven had a rate of fire about one hundred and twenty rounds. Um, the uh, the Flak forty three boosted that by almost fifty rounds. Um, so it was a uh, faster firing gun. And of course, there was the Flak Villain forty three as well, which had two guns mounted one on top of another, and uh, now you've got twice the firepower and and great. Uh, sights on them, uh, both optical and computing. And uh, they really were uh, very, very good weapons. Um, the, uh, the issue was there weren't a lot of them made. And the Germans always focused on producing the two centimeter guns, which were, I don't wanna say were not good because ballistically they performed exceptionally well. Their rate of fire was very good, but they were limited by their 20 round box magazine. And it wasn't until February of 45 that they fielded a small caliber light anti-aircraft gun uh, with the introduction of three centimeter, three centimeter Yaboshrek, uh, where they had a belt-fed weapon that fired at uh, a significant rate. So um, it, th these were box-fed weapons. We're not, yes. you know, it's, it's <laughs> nothing particularly fancy about it. It's just very, very literally fill loaded. up a box and it, it will run out of them pretty quickly. Yep. So yeah, normally, um, I'm trying to think of the basic load for the gun, I think it was one, one magazine per weapon and then I want to say eight per side, so four per extra gun, um, no, or four, four per gun in addition. So you could run out of ammunition really, really quickly. Um, sorry, that sounds like that. That's all right. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, 
you know, it was, you'd go, be going through a magazine change about every six seconds. So you've got attacking aircraft, you're concentrating on that, but then you've got people buzzing around you, thinking from the gunner's perspective, you've got people buzzing around you constantly, keeping you fed with and knocking you and yes. all, all of that just to keep up the rate of fire, which, you know, we, we've, we've sort of come to expect that sort of, you know, they talk about the walls of flak. So you've got a lot of guys beavering around, around this weapon, just to keep, just to keep it going, let alone shooting it in the right place. One of the ways that the Germans actually did a lot better than we did, you know, we tended to have um, at least on, on guns like the Bofors, which was our standard uh, medium, uh, medium caliber flak gun, We'd have one guy on traverse and one guy on elevation. And coordinating that took a lot of training. Um, the Germans had one guy doing both. Uh, you have one, one uh, hand wheel for traverse, one hand wheel for elevation. Your foot was your trigger and, and you know, your eyes were, were looking through the sights. So you could actually get that gun on target uh, and compute a firing solution a lot faster. Um, so that really was was very impressive when, when looking at the the actual gun and the train rates and everything like that. I'm I'm I haven't prepped you this question, but the you said the computer sites. Mm -hmm. How did that work? Because we we were very used to seeing the images of the good old almost sort of welded together wire wire cross and the guy looking mm -hmm. for lonely through it. Explain what. A computer site is because it's not a computer site as we would consider it today with it would basically compute a firing solution um giving you the this basically speed of the target um range and elevate you'd have to input speed of the target range to target and then it would actually give you a uh, or an altitude to target it would give you a rough firing solution as to where you need to point that gun to make sure that round gets there as the airplane gets there. Because, and just to make this perfectly clear, you do not shoot at the target, you shoot you well shoot ahead well of the target. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I find all that that fascinating. And sure. you know, for, for, for kids at school that think there's no practical uses for trigonometry, do not oh, yeah. Yeah, do, do, if you're thinking of going into anything artillery based, you're gonna need a lot of it. Um, sure. e even today when there's fancy boxes that do most of it for you. Yeah. Um, so flat crews, were they all Luftwaffe ground no. units or no, were no, they no. army as well? Um, they were, there were Harris flak, which was army flak. There was SS flak. Um, pretty much any panzer division had a battalion of flak and then had an anti-tank battalion, which had a flak company. And then there were smaller flak units attached to like the panzer companies and stuff like that as well. Um, so there was a lot of flak. Um, that, you know, the, the Germans realized that it was critical to their survival. So light flak units were actually prioritized um, and they were producing guns right up, you know, at, at, at incredibly high rates right up through the end of the war. Um, one of the biggest, you know, criticisms that we, I could uh, find of the, uh, the flak production is the fact that they focused on producing new guns rather than spare parts. Um, and you get a good gun broken in and something fails on it. You know, yeah, you can pull a part off of that brand new gun that's come in, or you can just take the new gun and you can go. And you know, that really was uh, a significant detriment to the flak buffer um, throughout the, the last couple of years. Of the war. And that's a huge thing. It's, it's, it's almost a standard issue th throughout Nazi Germany. It's, it's always the, 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 new, the new better thing. Right. rather than keeping the stuff that's working well going um and again we should mention that like all weapons they're like an engine they need a bit of running in they need you know they need to settle they need to get used to, to how they work it's not straight out of the box and they're perfect right so let's get on to the thing that i think everybody's been waiting waiting for the actual aircraft versus flak so p47 versus flak i guess we're going to be where are we going to be when we have our discussion for this? And just to sort of set the scene, are we going to be all over the place? Again, um, another question I haven't prepped you for. One of the, the engagements that I, I um, dealt with in the book was uh, 366 fighter group flying uh, close air support from the 7th Armored Division. 
Uh, 7th Armored Division had come up against the 106th Panzer Brigade. There were a couple of tanks uh, holding them up. And uh, the uh, one of their flight leads um, decided to, you know, checked in with uh, ground control, checked in with the guys on the front lines, found the, uh, the two tanks, rolled in, dive bombed, knocked out the Panther, and then took a, uh, a, a hit to his, uh, his empennage. Uh, blew a hole just in front of the, uh, the, the empennage itself. And from the photos that I have of the airplane, it looks like it severed the, uh, the elevator controls. And uh, he flipped inverted and went right into the ground. Um, and there were a number of eyewitness accounts on it. What he didn't see was the, the Flak Panzer mobile, mobile wagon with the Flak 43 mounted on it that got it. Um, and the 106 Panzer Brigade had just gotten brand new uh, 30, uh, Black 43 mobile wagons uh, a couple weeks prior. So in the one-on-one, -on -one, it could, the flak could be very deadly against, uh, against the Thunderbolt. Um, it was, of course, the primary threat. However, when it, it was that first shot that was most effective, once they knew that the flak was there, it could be suppressed. And the drugs really, well, the, the Army Air Force developed a number of weapon systems to be able to deal with that, uh, whether it was napalm or other types of incendiaries or uh, frag clusters or 260 pound fragmentation bombs or things like that. But um, things that, that really, uh, as soon as the, the flak arm uh, opened up, they would be targeted and, and uh, suppressed as, as, you know, with, with, without prejudice. <laughs> so so what just on that what elements would be flying so you know from from sort of my area on on second tactic you usually have a a flight of flight of four or eight typhoons they'd see a target and they they'd attack it woods occasionally there would be a, a flight for flak suppression but because they were spread so thin there wasn't always that luxury right. in the in in the ninth with the with the p47 would would they have dedicated aircraft to be looking for flak while you'd have dedicated aircraft looking for other targets? It depended it on the mission. Um, if it was a squadron strength mission, um, usually you'd have you know, a, a primary bomb uh, flight, a top cover flight, and either a secondary bomb uh, flight or uh, flak suppression. Um, so you know, if you're just on a, a flight of four uh, uh, area reconnaissance, you're not really going to have much uh, capability for black suppression. But if it's a full squadron of you know, mission going out, uh, that certainly would be taken into account, especially if the flak was, uh, was anticipated. Let's talk about what the P-47 will be throwing out, to, mainly because I just want to talk about the, the old M-10 stovepipe things. If you've not seen it, Google it. That's M-10 stovepipe. Because mm -hmm. it does look like someone has just put a bunch of scaffold tubes on the underside of a P-47 under each one. It's 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 it's, cra it's crazy. I love it. So so what what was this sort of standard standard loadout for, for say for an area an armed recce as we we'd call it over here? I guess the most common load would be two five hundred pound bombs uh, under wing and a two hundred and sixty pound frag on the center. Towards the end of the war, you get a lot of things sort of uh, changing up. Uh, M twenty seven clusters, which have uh, six ninety millimeter uh, ninety excuse me six ninety pound cluster bombs uh, under under each wing. Let's see M41 frags, which were 20-pound uh, bombs, uh, usually in clusters of six, and you could strap several of those under, under each wing. Um, the M10A1 uh, incendiary bombs, which are basically a, uh, an incendiary cluster bomb, uh, kind of like what you'd see uh, the B-29s dropping in, uh, in, uh, the, in the Pacific Theater. Uh, but these were would have it like a 500-pound fin, 500-pounder, uh, Thin assembly attached to the back of it uh, to give it a bit better ballistics. Uh, those started coming in uh, pretty late uh, in the early game phase, but they did, uh, did see some combat. Um, and then, you know, napalm, uh, basically taking uh, either 75 or uh, paper, well, paper 108s, uh, I haven't really seen much, but the, uh, the metal 110s and the, uh, the 150 gallon flat tanks were all used uh, as napalm canisters. Uh, 
And I think that's that's one of those interesting things because we don't tend to think about napalm in Europe, do we? Mm. It's upward de de debut. Yeah, it, and and that and that's the thing. Yeah, we're we're so used to that. You know, those those classic color images of the corsairs taking off with a landing gear drowning mm. at Okinawa and just dropping napalm, turning around and landing again. That's kind of where a sort of that basic idea of what it is. But even in Europe, we're talking napalm. We're talking cluster bombs we're talking everything that you have to hand you're going to use so and rockets of course too you know, like the, the m10 tubes um those tended not to be a lot of groups didn't like them uh they tested them out and they were not very accurate they were really good for area suppression I and mean, basically each round is 105 millimeter artillery round um so you're you're putting a significant amount of firepower um you know down range uh, but they, the, the fins on them were not very stabilizing. Um, the, uh, the, the forward firing aircraft rockets, uh, the Mark 7s, and then later the, the high velocity aircraft rockets uh, were more effective. Um, and those were zero length launchers, um, basically just mounted on, on stubs under the wing. Uh, they were much better aerodynamically and performance wise. Um, there were still issues with the Mark 7s, which came out. Uh, sort of summer of 44, um, because they were underpowered. Uh, basically the Mark VII took a five inch artillery shell, made it to a three and a half inch rocket motor, and uh, they were nose headed. So the rocket would, would push off and it would nose down. Mm -hmm. Daniel pilots got really good with sort of, you know, uh, bumping just before they, uh, you know, when they start their dive and they bump launch and, and could get the, the rocket somewhat close to the target. When the uh, five, in five inch high velocity aircraft rocket came out, that mated that same warhead with now a five inch rocket motor, uh, which gave enough thrust and, and balanced out enough that uh, it was far more effective. Uh, but those really didn't, uh, didn't get into service until late 44 um, and, and were you know, so much more effective. And I think we need to, to bring up the elephant in the room when we talk about rockets. You've said the exact words I like, area suppression, because this is very much, yes. we are firing them into an area, a mm -hmm. target area, that we hope will get some hits in. Because these are, you know, as we were talking about this before, a lot of people have, you know, that, the, that Gulf War One image of the truck driving across the bridge and the laser-guided bomb chasing it down. This is not that. This is fireworks with high explosives on the end, isn't it? Exactly. Um, you know, I, I can tell you, having fired rockets from a, a fairly fast-moving aircraft, there's a lot of Kentucky windage to it. Uh, and in the AH-64, there's a, a weapons processor that helps you aim. So it's still, you know, a crapshoot in a lot of ways. That is interesting to hear. And yeah. we'll have to have you back to talk about your Apache days. Sure. Um, but let's let's stick to the the topic at hand. So what what was the experience? You, we we've mentioned briefly the the lucky shot that could bring down an aircraft. But what 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 was the sort of experience of the the P forty seven crews as they were as they were supporting the advance? I suppose especially trying to keep up with with the Cobra breakout as well because that would have been quite a wild ride. Absolutely, um, you know, and of course the the, the jug developed a, a very. Uh, strong reputation for getting its crews home. Um, there were Mustang pilots who would say, you know, yeah, the, the Mustang's the airplane you want to fly, but you know, the, uh, the jug's the, the airplane that's going to get you home. You know, it, it's, it could take a hit. One of the, one of the photos, and actually I think we can use it for the title page, if, uh, if my is, for, is a shot of a 404th fighter group uh, pilot with his hand going through the blade of the prop where there's a massive hole. Uh, and of course, that's always mislabeled as, oh, he had an 88 millimeter hit to, uh, to the propeller. Of course, no, it was an 88 hit, the propeller and the airplane would have been gone. Uh, but it was a, a solid 20 millimeter hit that blew a hole through his propeller blade. And uh, aside from vibration, you know, which I'm sure got quite uncomfortable, uh, he was able to fly the airplane home. I love that picture. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my favorites. This feels bad. I'm I'm going to segue from from giggling um, to 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 losses because this is an incredibly bloody time for close air support crews. Yeah. Um, you know, just you know, from 
I am going to mention typhoons, you know, through through the Normandy campaign, it's, you know, it's 247 aircraft and 151 pilots sure. in, in, in that 90 days. Uh, what was it, what was it like um, for the, for the P-47 crews? W were they suffering as, as, as badly in, in this role as, as two TAFs um, ground yeah. aircraft were? Yeah. I mean, it was, I, I, I don't have the, the numbers in front of me, but you know, there was something like, you know, well over a thousand, P-47s lost uh, in combat, uh, just in the air um, I'm not sure the number of pilots uh, off the top of my head, but I mean, it, was, it was a fair amount. Um, usually, because of the, the, the judge's ability to take a hit, pilots did get out. Uh, but you know, I was just reading a, a, uh, an account the other day about you know, a pilot who, who looked like he successfully belly landed the airplane and just didn't get out. Um, so there, there was an incredible amount of loss. Um, I don't think we're we're looking 100% um, attrition rates, but but you know there were definitely were you know per squadron you were losing at least I think it was I think the figure I looked at was like two a month, which you know, was pretty high, pretty high. Mm. So let's turn this round again to the 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 German side. The they're falling back at an increasing rate through late '44. And I think I've, I've always described it as this sort of this circle that's getting smaller. So flak is getting more concentrated, but they're losing quite a lot of trains, train crews, yep. weaponry. Um, you know, we were talking about spares earlier. You know, even though there's more getting packed into an area, is the quality dropping or is it actually getting worse just because there's more of it? I think, yeah, I mean, at, at any time you, you concentrate a number of flak guns in an area, their capability is going to increase. And as they were pulling back, you know, yes, they, they were losing ammunition, you know, in, in trains and everything, but their supply lines were shortening significantly too. So you're going to have to go as far to, to get those, those uh, rounds to that gun. It, it definitely did. Uh, there, there was a lull um, in November through January. And of course, there's a slight spike because of the bulge. Um, but really, you know, you see it up through uh, September, September, October of 44, and then it starts to dip, kicks up a little bit again for the bulge, and then uh, January, February, it, it bottoms out, and then the last, you know, really two months of the war, um, it, it does spike up again. I, it's, it's another another thing I, I want to do as well is those last few months of the war, because people think, think oh, the war is nearly over, it's, it's calming down, and right. it's, speci especially if, especially on the ground it's not <laughs> no it's not it's, it's getting um, much yeah. much more difficult and much more dramatic and it's you know it's 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 trying to make sure that it will end with the you know the he the heaviest amount of casualties on the other side as they can right. um it's I, I i i find that sort of february to to may period just mind-blowing you know sort sure. of you know especially around veritable and, and and things like that um mm -hmm. You can't get your head around just how vicious it is, and right. in your head you're going, "It's going to end in oh, two right. months' time." But they, of course, they didn't know that. But it's you, you, sure. it's, it's mind blowing, isn't it? Well, I have a great great example. There is Ray Knight, who was a lieutenant with the three hundred fiftieth Fighter Group, Twelfth Air Force, uh, in Italy. In the last week of April, uh, last two weeks of April, um, there the, the Germans are really gearing up for a major counteroffensive. Uh, to back across the Po River, and the Luftwaffe in, in particular is really, you know, they're they're pretty much pulling out all the stops. Every aircraft they had, every you know, every bomb, every you know, round uh, was loaded and ready to go. And the 350th uh, caught them, pretty much caught them on the ground. And over a two-day period, um, they really hammered them as much as possible uh, from the, I think it was the 23rd to the 25th uh, of April. And uh, Lieutenant Knight was a, was a flight leader of uh, the 346th Fighter Squadron, so 350th Fighter Group. And he continually went back um, and, and attacked Bergamo Airdrome, uh, knocked out, I think it's some, I don't remember correctly, I think it was 14 aircraft himself uh, destroyed in the aircraft. Um, but even after his aircraft was damaged, he kept uh, going back to, uh, to identify enemy aircraft for his flight mates and, and lead them into the target. Uh, and 
and, you know, it was some of the most intense flak um, over over the airfield uh, of the war. And uh, on his way back to to base to rearm and reload, um, his his airplane was pretty uh, pretty badly shot up, and it just pretty much stopped flying as they were trying to cross over the Apennines, and his, he crashed and, and was killed. Uh, but because of, of just the, the intensity of his efforts and, and, and just the, the ability to lead, he was uh, actually uh, posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. And that is a tricky airfield because it, it's still New States, Brigham Airport. And yeah, sure. If, if you go skiing, you've probably flown there if you go skiing in Italy. I won't say that too loud because my wife will get upset. She's desperate to go skiing, <laughs> and of course she can't. I think that's you know th that's the thing I always find fascinating. I'm really looking forward to, to getting my hands on your book when it when it's out. Is you know we the the sort of experiences that we have. I think some of the most vivid are you know Klosterman's book about the, the being uh, attacking Kiel at the end. Granted, he took some liberties with 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 that account, it's but it's there. It is yeah. I think it's it's one of the more uh, impactful to sort of show what what these guys were flying into in the end because it's you know the the wall of flak statement that you always you always hear um i think it's there's something when you read the the, the close support guys accounts it's a slightly different different experience to a terrifying big black puff in a rain of shrapnel hitting your aircraft at twenty five thousand feet to literally the sky being filled a tracer yeah and it moving at different rates as well. That's what always gets me in some of the descriptions is yeah. you know, you, you've got something moving at well over twice the speed of sound, but you have a, a big glowing ball that doesn't look like it's moving very fast until it goes zipping past the cockpit. Exactly. Those, yeah. those third, optical effects. Yeah, 3750 and 50, 50 millimeter, five centimeter. Yeah, they, they do have different muzzle velocities. So, I mean, they, they definitely look different from in flight from the standard 20 millimeter uh, is most common. I, I think, you know, the, the thing that always brings me up a little bit cold when I'm reading to the log books or bees, I'm sure it's the same with you, is that little phrase, especially in the British ones, which is bags of flak. Because you know that's understatement. Yes. And you just think how, how you know, we've got to, A, we've got to fly into that. We've got to find a target, hit the target, and then get out again. Mm -hmm. And and make multiple passes over that. Mm. So, yeah. It's it's not just dropping your rockets or your bombs. It's then going around again and, you know, supporting the guys that are about to come in. Sure. With, with cannon and trying to draw some of that off. Yep. Um, and you know, I, go and, you know, drop your ordinance and then come back and strike. I think Harry Hardy, the... Um, Canadian typhoon pilot is a bit, bit of a hero of mine. He he always said his worst spot was number three mm -hmm. because the first guy would have a bit of surprise. The second guy would have the, the glory of a lot of things exploding as he was coming in. But by three, they were ready for you. Yep. Um, and you sort of think, well, actually, that, that sort of changes the perspective, especially if you've only got you know three or four aircraft coming in. If, if three is bad, four is going to get it straight up the, sure. the pipe is it we 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 digress so what just to start wrapping up seeing seeing the time and i i realize you've got to go back to work whereas i'm about to go make myself the first gin and tonic of the evening actually um, is it, it is that time it is friday um mm. we, we sort of we mentioned briefly those 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 last few months of the war what what did that look like um sort of broadly for for the p-47s um crews and the, and the squadrons they were you know it was sort of in the sort of static places come february may that they'd be operating from for the last few months wasn't it so what was that experience as, as the war sort of came to an end for them? actually there was a lot of movement um a lot of new airplanes first of all you know the the p47 d30s were coming uh, were coming in as of late 44 um and the d30 gave um now had um dive uh dive brakes um to, to deal with compressibility in a dive. They had better instrumentation in the cockpit. Um, they had uh, better bomb release mechanisms and everything. And also, you know, because of the speed of the, the uh, retreat, you know, we were operating from airfields within Germany uh, by late March. Uh, mm -hmm. So they were constantly changing airfields um, and, and moving forward. And you know, they, they'd 
the airplanes would, would go in and the ground element would, would uh, eventually catch up and, and uh, would take over at Kitzingen or, or uh, Nordholz, or, or, and which is pretty much where they ended the war. Um, but yeah, in the last couple of weeks, they, they were they were really um, flying from within Germany. And how, how far would they be going? Because just th- there's some accounts where they're the line of where the Russians were getting to as well. What mm-hmm. sort of depth would they be going towards on that? Because especially on the sort of su- southern front, that was much more of an issue than it was up north. Right, yeah, it certainly was. Um, they were, let's see, I mean, they were, like the 405th was operating uh, into Czechoslovakia um, and, and supporting uh, Third Army's drive there. Um, but, you know, as far as, you know, just how far uh, east, I'm not exactly sure, but you know, I, I know that I would have to double check to see just how far uh, they were supporting Seventh Army um, because they were the, the farthest south. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, they were pretty much ranging up to and, and just past the, the front lines. Um, and uh, there were some uh, encounters with uh, with Russian aircraft, but not, not a lot, uh, at least on the, the P 47 and things. So, how much longer did the, the jug stay in service? Last ones came out of service in 1955. Actually, um, they were pretty much relegated to uh, the National Guard by about 1947. There were a few active duty units uh, that stayed in Europe right after the war and a few you know, stateside, but really by uh, by 47, they'd been uh, all moved over to the uh, to the Guard. Um, you know, there was there's a lot always been the internal question why the uh, P-47 didn't fly in uh, Korea as well. Um, is, you know, should be a much better close air support uh, platform than uh, the Mustang. Uh, and there's a number of, uh, of reasons for that, but uh, you know, logistically, uh, it made more sense for them to, to for them to reactivate the hundred or so Mustangs that were in Japan than it did to ship uh, P-47s that used four times the gas uh, over to over to the Pacific Rim. Because it it was the public's follow up the the jet that was the Thunder Jet. Yes. They were using ground, ground support, which yep. had that same reputation for ruggedness that the Republic sort of built its its name on, wasn't it? Sure did. And, and it's, you know, the Korean War is uh, pretty much a, a mirror of the uh, of World War II, where it's the North American jet, you know, or North American aircraft that gets all the uh, the glory and everything, and the uh, Republic jet that does all the work. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, I'd, I'd, love, I'd love to do just an episode of looking at Republic, because... You know, the, there's a lot of similarities there with with, with Hawkers in that sort of range of aircraft. Because you look at the the is it the P36 that came before, it, it looks like a small P47. They, they've they've got that Republic look. P35. Yeah. yeah yes. Um. And even, even the Thunderjet sort of got that those sort of angles on it that you can you can spot the maker. Yeah. Um. It's 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 good fun. Whereas you know, North American just got old fancy, didn't they? Um, <laughs> Um, I, I can't I can't not talk about one of my favorite movies that I hate, which is Fighter Squadron. Oh yeah. Which, Terrible. Uh, uh, it is the worst. Um, you know, this is if you've not seen it, you can find it on YouTube. It is, you know, it's Raoul Welsh. You know, this is the man who, you know, made the thief of Baghdad white heat, making a movie which the star is the P47. Um just skip all the bits where people are actually talking, talking. And, you're Andrei, and you get to see a bunch of mustangs painted up as messersmiths yes which is which is which is fantastic so there you go there's there's a movie recommendation for you folks john when is the book out uh it'll be out uh, i think october 26th so. super we'll, we'll we'll make sure to give it give it a give it a plug um, when it's when it's there and i guess that's it from us thank you so much for your time um this has been fun we'll, we'll have we'll have you back we'll do, we'll do we'll do something that's slightly different next time thank you. but thank you very much for your time john and um, all the best anytime glad to be here we'd like to thank john once again for joining us and his book which is entitled p47 thunderbolt versus german flak defenses western europe 1943 through 45 is one of the new titles from osprey's jewel series it is out on the 28th of october And you can order it through our very own bookshop, about which here's some more information. When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. 
So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash hack history or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support and here's to your next great book. In 2020, when the boss ladies, Alex and Alina, started History Hack, the world was very strange. And unfortunately, it looks like 2021 is going to be equally strange. We would love it if you're able to support the podcast in any way. It will allow us to keep up the regularity of the pods and also the great guests that we've been able to bring you over the last year. We exist on Patreon as History Hack and also on Podbean, our podcast host's own platform called Patreon. The reward tiers are being updated at the moment, so there's going to be some fantastic options for you to choose from. So if you're able to support us, that would be fantastic. So we thank you very much, and until the next time, bye.